Have you ever done a presentation and it was on the graveyard shift? Last one of the day. Everybody's beginning to feel it a bit. Ooh. Well, this is one worth waiting for. This is one worth staying for. I'm glad you're still here for this one. Will you please welcome to the stage for steering your ship, Brendan Hall. Make yourselves comfortable. I'm going to tell you a story. And I'm going to start that story by telling you about the time that I was so scared. I was physically sick. Literally vomiting down my front. Now, I'd skipped a lot of boats in heavy weather before, but nothing like this. Nothing at all like this. Outside on the deck of our 68-foot racing yacht, the North Pacific hurricane that we were in was raging around us. 90, 95 mile an hour winds, waves getting up to 20, 25 vertical meters in height, terrifying. A few moments later, the boat was knocked down. Now a knockdown's about the scariest thing that can happen on a sailing yacht. So a wave hits the boat on its flank and rolls it over in the water. The top of the mast, which is normally 100 feet in the air, is plunged down into the sea. The boat struggles back upright. Now, I was inside when that happened, having, having just been sick, and I was thrown sideways, smashed against the wall of this small head's cabin that I was in. And I remember catching a glimpse of myself in this little dull, scratched-up mirror that we had on the wall. And I'll never forget the look of fear that was on my face. And in that moment, there were only two thoughts in my mind. The first was that one or more of my crew were going to die tonight in this hurricane, this is where it happens. And second, of course, why the hell did I agree to get on this yacht? So I want to share some stories with you today and tell you about the journey that took my crew and I up to being in that horrendous situation and about some of the things we learned along the way and some of the things that allowed us to get out the other side. Because if you asked me to imagine a point in my life where I felt absolute overwhelming uncertainty and unsafety, that would have been it. But first, I want to introduce you to the race that we were competing in at the time, called the Clipper Round the World Race. Take a look at this. In September 2009, 200 intrepid adventurers set sail from Hull in the United Kingdom. In a race to circumnavigate the globe. They represented contrasting backgrounds, nationalities, and ages. 40% of them had never stepped on a boat before. Get me out! <laughs> These rookies were taking part in the epic journey that is the Clipper Round the World Race. The tears in my eyes is incredible. They had to take on the elements. I am probably the most scared I've ever been in my life. Enough of this shit. Crammed together for up to a month at a time, they had to cope with each other. You know, it's all made in the best possible yeah, taste. You always have to say something. Well, you don't sit in your bunk and think about it. Oh, yeah. Go and sit on your bunk and think about it. It was a pulsating voyage. <laughs> yes! Full of emotion. I think it's a big f***ing joke going, sorry. I'm not going to talk on camera. Probably a bad, a bad night, as you can imagine. And packed with heart-stopping drama. <laughs> We're preparing to abandon shipping. If you want a standard sailing program, don't watch this. If you want human adventure played out on the high seas, this is must see TV. This is like the wettest, wildest fairground ride you've ever been on, but you can't stop and you can't get off.
So, exciting stuff. The Clipper race is raced every two years. It takes 10 months to do a full circumnavigation of the planet, and it's raced on these 10 identical racing yachts. Now, in the sailing world, that's a really important thing. We call it a matched fleet. It means all the boats were, were built at the same time, same mold, they got identical equipment, so that any result out on the water is purely down to the team sailing them, not, not because the boat itself is superior. It's also the world's only amateur yacht race, so anyone can, can sign up and do this. Any member of the general public can do it. I've got some sign-up forms in my bag. I'm sure you're all really keen, having just watched that. Um, but it's open to the world. Um, each team is comprised of 44 people, of whom 20 are on the boat at any one time, because when people sign up to do it, they can either nominate to do the full round-the-world trip or just a smaller section of it. And each of the teams is led by a single professional skipper, of which I was one, and this is my boat here, called Spirit of Australia. Now, the crew that sign up to the Clipper Race are an incredibly diverse bunch, coming from all walks of life. On, uh, on Spirit of Australia, my youngest crew member was 17, just finished school. My oldest was 63, recently had a, a hip replacement. It was about a 60-40 split of uh, men to women, and just all, all backgrounds and all careers and all life stories were represented with, within this crew pool. And these guys who have signed up, they are taking the most massive step into uncertainty. I mean, you saw in the video, 40% had never stepped on a boat before electing to do this. That's crazy, right? And unlike a lot of other extreme sports, say, for instance, mountaineering, where people can decide they want to get into it and they can start with small challenges and, and then work their way up to wh wherever their ambition takes them, with this, you know, you can still be more or less a rank amateur with six weeks of training under your belt. And then you can be sort of helicopter dropped onto this powerful sailing yacht to do a leg of the race through the Southern Ocean, which, you know, as we know, is the sort of final frontier of, of the ocean, certainly of, of ocean racing. And they're paying handsomely to do it. Each one of these people that sign up pay a large fee to the organizers to get their, their place on the race. They obviously leave their careers behind for the, the time they're at sea, sacrifice their earning potential, not to mention leaving friends, family, children, loved ones behind to pursue this dream of sailing around the world. A dream that's been very, very skillfully marketed to them as a life-changing experience. For the skippers, 10 skippers, all professionals, one of them leading each of the teams, this is a leadership challenge like no other. For two reasons. The first is you get no say in who's on your team. The race organizers, they take this crew pool of 450 people and they divide them out evenly into the 10 teams, making sure that there's a, an equal mixture of men and women, there's a range of ages, and that all prior sailing experience, because there are a lot of really good sailors sign up to do this, are divided out evenly, again, in the interest of making sure that everything's totally fair and even before the start. But more than that, the reason it's a leadership challenge like no other is that the crew who sign up for this sign up for just the most differing, diverging, contradictory reasons. When I was first assigned my team, and I was essentially given a, a list of uh, 44 names and contact details on a sheet of A4 paper and told, this is your crew, I was super organized. I had this uh, a questionnaire ready, and I sent them all out on email and asking them why they were doing the race, what they hoped to get out of it, you know, what type of roles they might like to try on board the boat. Trying to get under their skin, you know, understand their motivations. And the answers I got back just blew me away by how different they were. I had one guy who replied, he replied about 20 minutes after I sent this email. He only replied to one of the questions. And I'll quote him, he said, I'm here to win, second place is the first loser. Hyper-competitive didn't even begin to describe this guy. And he was one of my round-the-worlders. I was going to be stuck with him for 10 months. To someone else, she replied just before the deadline. I said, you've got to get the email to me by this day. And after scrolling down this War and Peace-esque life story email, she cuts to the chase in the final paragraph and says she's on the race to try and meet her husband. <laughs> when I talk to uh, groups of millennials and school children, I tell them this is what people were forced to do before Tinder and dating apps were a thing. But seriously, so there I was, the skipper of this team. I had to create this, this, this team ethos and this culture and this way of working that was going to satisfy the most needs of the most people, obviously keep us all safe, um, and, and be high-performing and, and, and while sitting somewhere in between those, those two extremes. And that was one of the biggest challenges and most important tasks of all of the 10 skippers, and we all went about it in a slightly different way. But I want to rewind a little bit and tell you about the very start of my, my journey. When I decided that this was my ambition, this was the kind of the, the, the wall that I wanted to lean the ladder of my life up against, I went and I did some research. I found as many people who had done this race previously, and I, I went to sort of find out what they knew and learn their secrets. And something became clear very, very quickly, was that this wasn't a race of 10 yachts. This was a race of 10 teams. And it wasn't the best group of sailors that was going to perform and win in this context. 
It was the team that did the high performance teamwork stuff the best. The team that had that compelling vision, clearly articulated. They had that strong set of values, which of course safety is, is primary. Um, they, uh, that everyone adhered to. They had a, a, a cohesive set of processes. They managed conflict well. They had a culture of coaching and training. I mean, all those things that make any of your, you know, your commercial ventures a success, that's what was going to make the difference for us. But more than any of that, of course, we had to keep our people safe. The people who sign up for this race are people's fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, brothers, and sisters. And as the skipper, it was my responsibility, more than anyone else's, to make sure that they all got back to their loved ones at the end of this adventure. It was a huge burden to bear. Because the environment that we were heading out into was one of huge uncertainty and constant change, which is, is what the ocean represents to me. When you're out there ocean racing, you've got a race course that's 3,000 miles long by 2,000 miles wide. You can move within it strategically however you want. The weather, which obviously dictates every strategic decision you make, you don't know what's coming more than you know, four or five days in advance really with any accuracy. As you saw in that video, the, the, the threat of real danger, physical danger to our bodies was ever present. And at the same time, we're in a, a high-performing yacht race. You know, we're, we're trying to continually outperform, outmaneuver, outstrategize our, our nine rivals and get to the, uh, the start, the, uh, get to the finish line first. So that culture is, uh, was, was hugely important and the safety aspect of it primarily so. So I want to share two stories with you today two of the big incidents that we had on the race and two of the most powerful learning experiences that I had. Now, I'm not the hero of the story in all of these. In fact, I want to share with you some times where I was humbled, times where I learned some really valuable lessons, um, particularly around safety. So I want to start off. We started the race in the UK. We sailed south to Rio de Janeiro, and our next leg of the race was from Rio to Cape Town. Now, the fastest way to get from Rio to Cape Town isn't a straight line. The fastest way is to go dive straight south to the Southern Ocean and catch the, 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 the top edge of those big weather systems and that'll catapult you towards Cape Town. And it was 10 days into that leg of the race that we had our first big incident, our first big disaster, caused by something completely random. We, we, we didn't foresee a tiny five pence LED light bulb that illuminated the compass, winked out in the middle of the night as we were bombing along, doing mid-20 knots. The boat slew violently into a crash jibe in 40 knots of wind. The boom swung across the boat. The two lines designed to stop that happening with a combined braking strain of 16 tons just snapped like parcel string. The boom whips across the boat just above head height, crashes into the other side. The boat slews right over in the water. We're ripped to shreds our two most important sails. It's chaos carnage up on deck. We've narrowly avoided injuring some people. We've broken some critical equipment. This was our first big test, our first big disaster. Now, we had a cameraman embedded on our boat for this leg who was making this Discovery Channel documentary. And immediately after this had happened, he stuck a camera in my face. And I just want you to gauge the level of resilience that's on display as you watch this. Probably about as bad a night as you can imagine for a, a sailing skipper. We're just going to ride it out until morning. Um, we've basically stopped racing. We're, you know, we're, we're out of this race um, for now. We just don't deserve this. Spirit of Australia's problems don't end there. For three days and nights, they're battered mercilessly. And then, just when they feel things can't get any worse, they suffer a second, more serious crash jive. We don't deserve this. We really don't deserve this. Three nights in a row, three disasters. Um, I don't know what we've done, um, but it's just so frustrating for me and for everybody. You know, we didn't need another knock to uh, our confidence, so... Um. So I know what you're thinking. Like Winston Churchill without the cigar. What a strong-jawed, resolute, 
kind of response to, to, to setback and disappointment. I mean, quite the opposite. You know, when I saw that footage for the first time, it, it absolutely took my breath away. That not, I mean, I, I, I wasn't saying anything because I thought that's what the, the camera wanted to see. I was just speaking sort of from the heart. That was my go-to emotional response. That's not great leadership right there. I don't actually remember what happened that night. I remember, you know, we, we sorted it out. We got the boat sailing again and, and, you know, kept everyone safe. But what I do remember was the next day, we were having one of our daily meetings. We had a, a daily sort of toolbox talk and a meeting every single day at lunchtime. We were sat there on the deck of the boat, all the crew, and I remember saying the same kinds of things, like, this is unfair, we don't deserve this. What have we done, universe, to bring this bad fortune on ourselves? And again, the crew were taking their cues from the way I was responding to this situation. And the conversation was really kind of spiraling down the plug hole until one of the crew, he was a, he was a, a doctor, uh, ran a medical practice in his life ashore, and he just, he, he, he says to everyone, right, stop. He said, just like this, right, everyone stop. We can't be talking to each other like this. We can't be saying these things. This is the first time this has happened to us. We've got to make sure we learn a lesson. And I've got something that I think could really help us. And it really sort of took us aback because he was quite a quiet chap. And we said, okay. And he said, right, it's something I read in a book about a year ago. It's called Growth Mindset. Has anyone here heard of it? I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very well-researched, well-established idea. Now, back then, the book had just been written. None of us had ever heard of it. And we said, okay, well, what is this thing? And he says it just like this. Okay, so growth mindset is the idea that bad stuff happens. You can't always avoid it. Um, but the most important thing is that when it does happen, you have the conversation, you learn a lesson, and in a team environment like this, that the lesson is shared so that we don't make that same mistake again. And it, when he said it like that, it just seemed like absolute common sense. Of course, that's right. And so that kicked off a discussion on the deck of this yacht. What could we learn from these last three days of, of difficulties and disasters that we'd just had? And it was during that conversation that I realized that I had made a huge assumption about this race that was just wrong. Yes, I'd seen the race as a race of 10 teams rather than a race of 10 yachts, but they were 10 teams with identical starting resources, broadly following the same strategy, going through the same kinds of experiences, facing the same kinds of challenges at around the same time, and broadly getting better and improving at the same rate. But it was during that conversation I realized that that's not right, that's not how yacht racing works, and that's not how life works. Just going through an experience doesn't necessarily mean you take anything from it, you learn a lesson from it. That's a conscious, that's a very deliberate practice. And there's a fantastic quote that I love, is that we don't learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. And this was going to be huge for us because, I mean, we're, we're in a round-the-world yacht race for amateur sailors. Like, what, what were we expecting? To go around the world with, with absolutely no incidents or accidents like this? It would, you know, that, that would be an unrealistic goal. But the most important thing was is that any time anytime something like this happened, with all the preparations and mitigations we put in place, if something did slip through the net, we learned that lesson. Because it was going to go one of two ways. Either we could carry on talking to each other like we were there, this is unfair, we don't deserve this, sort of sweep it under the rug, maybe keep our egos intact, or we could open ourselves up, have a discussion, show some vulnerability, talk about what we did that maybe contributed to you know, these issues here, come up with processes that don't stop them from happening again. And we made a vow to each other that day, sounds really cheesy, we made a vow to each other that we would only learn the hard lessons once. And that became integral to our whole campaign. And I tell you, by the end of this race, that phrase summed up our biggest competitive advantage. We only learned the hard lessons once. So that was our first touch point with this idea of growth mindset. But the place it really came alive was when we arrived in Cape Town. We carried on under a smaller sail plan. We limped into Cape Town, arrived in seventh place. I thought we were going to be dead last for sure, but um, there were other boats that were damaged even worse than we were. And after a few days away for everyone to uh, gather their thoughts and reflect on the experience we'd had, we all got back together in this little meeting room above the Yacht Club bar, and, and we're going to have our, our debrief on the leg we'd just had. Um, and my intention was to do, uh, have what we called a black box meeting. You know the black boxes on aircraft that they, they use to piece together what happened in any kind of accident scenario? We were going to do that same sort of thing. We were going to go through and very systematically, very deliberately, um, even surgically, piece together what had happened, what had led up to the incidents that we'd had, and, and make sure that we learned a lesson, it was shared, and so it didn't happen again. But that's a really difficult conversation to have. And I had to be sure that there was no blame in that room, because we all know what happened when blame starts getting thrown around in scenarios like this. 
immediately the defensive shields go up and people's scope of concern narrows from how can I speak openly, honestly, vulnerably about the things that I did, the challenges I faced, what I've learned and what I'm going to do better next time to sort of how can I minimize my responsibility, how can I creatively self-justify why things went the way they went or worse yet, sort of push blame off onto other people. So the way I created that no blame space was by doing two things. The first, when people came in, I said, this is a no blame space. And for this team, we are only going to use blame in the event of malice or gross negligence. Everything else is a learning experience. Just putting it like that, you know, it, you could tell people's body language relaxed. But it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to do it. And I took this other idea, and I, I permanently borrowed this idea off the, uh, the Red Arrows, which is the United Kingdom's Air Force kind of aerobatic stunt pilot team. So the Red Arrows, they put on an, an, an aerobatics display from the ground. It looks like a flawless execution. The plane's looping and flying past one another. As soon as they've finished the show, they land at the airfield and still in their flight suits, they grab a drink of water and they go into the debrief room and they watch back on a big screen the, uh, the film of the uh, display they've just put on. And it's the leader of that team, call sign Red One, who's the first to speak. And what he or she says is, this is where I went wrong. This is what I learned. This is where I'm going to tighten up my formation or, or do this differently. And by doing that, they plant a flag in the sand, essentially saying, leave your egos at the door. We're here to learn lessons. No one's going to get berated. You know, we, we, we encourage that open sharing because we're here and we all want to get, um, get better and improve things next time. So I did that. As soon as we started talking about one of the issues on the race, I made sure, as, as difficult as it can be, particularly as the leader, you don't want people questioning your confidence or losing confidence in you. But I had to plant that same flag in the sand and say, this is what I got wrong, this is what I've learned, this is what I'm going to do next time. And it worked. It created this space where the, the whole dynamic in the room changed and people started bringing these things out. We spent the whole day in this room. We came up with some fantastic, actionable you know, ideas that you know, sustained the rest of our campaign for the Ray around the world. And as I said before, this became our biggest competitive advantage. It might seem like a small thing, but the other teams in this race just seemed to fall into the same traps, the same habits, the same patterns. And now I work with a lot of businesses now, large and small, in safety critical industries and, and, and others. And I would say the biggest blocker I see to true organizational resilience and, and you know, in the field safety is that organizations, many of them, are not wired to be able to have these kind of conversations. It's not in their DNA because the cost to the individual is too high because of the incentives and uh, Professor Hopkins perfectly elucidated you know, the corrupting effect of you know, monetary incentives on safety culture. The incentives that they've got set up in the culture mean that people won't speak up because the cost is too high. The monetary cost, the professional cost in the case of uh, uh, you know, promotion or uh, uh, yeah, some kind of other opportunity, um, or even just the social cost. Small comments like, oh, you know, you're reporting this, great, well, that's half a day of paperwork for me, thanks very much. Small things like that shutting down the conversation. The cost to the individual is too high, so what do they do? They just they don't say anything. They clam up. Or worse than that, they, they push blame off onto other people, they refuse to challenge upwards, they push pressure downwards, and sometimes introduce some of the worst aspects of corporate politics into their organization, which, which for the people on the front line can often mean that they pay the ultimate price. And often these systemic issues aren't noticed until either it's had a big effect on the bottom line, or you know, they've had an incident, or you know, the talents start leaving. And for the febrile VUCA world that we inhabit, and your industry certainly inhabits that, that just won't do. So that learning of the lessons was a, a huge takeaway for me from that part of the race. And I think it's perfectly summarized here. What I was trying to create was a just culture. Because it's all well and good to say we have a growth mindset, we have a safety culture, write it on the wall, put it in a training manual. But that can only exist inside of a just culture, and a just culture is one that understands that even the most skilled, highly trained, qualified professionals will still make mistakes. And the key thing is that they feel safe to bring those things forward without blame or fear, so that everyone can learn the lesson, and that lesson only has to be learned once. I want to fast forward now. 15,000 nautical miles, five months at sea. From Cape Town, we sailed again through the Southern Ocean to Western Australia. We played a very safe game, 
We'd had our fingers burnt. We didn't want a repeat of that. From Western Australia, we raced north through uh, Indonesia, through the Sunda Straits. I remember seeing the volcano Krakatoa sort of smoldering with the, the morning sunlight behind it. We raced to Singapore, and then we beat our way north into the northeast monsoon to Qingdao, where we're arriving into here. Now, on those races, we'd had some more mediocre results. We'd done a little bit more damage to the boat, but actually, as we arrive into the Olympic Sailing Marina here, we're on a high, because my team and I have just won our first leg of the Clipper race. So, you know, our high-performance teamwork is in a good place. We're finding that we're, we're not doing anything, we're not making the boat go any faster than the other teams, we're just not making as many mistakes. They're slowly falling behind, eliminating themselves. There's an old adage that you don't win a yacht race, you lose a yacht race. But the biggest challenge of this race was still to come, a crossing of the North Pacific Ocean. Now, if you tell someone you're about to go sailing across the Pacific, invariably their minds turn to the South Pacific and they imagine like Hawaii or Tahiti and the beautiful turquoise water and the beaches and the cocktail with fruit in it, and they think you're off on just a lovely, lovely adventure. But that is not the case of the North Pacific in wintertime. It is vile, cold, these huge weather systems, they spin up off Mongolia, sucking up all the cold air there, they're out across the Yellow Sea, they smash Japan, and they're out off, off across the Pacific with nothing to stop them or get in their way, um, just intensifying and deepening until they smash into the Alaskan coastline, sort of four or five days later. Now, based on all the meteorological research I'd done, I knew that on, on the duration of the crossing, this was going to be our longest crossing of the race, six and a half thousand nautical miles, five and a half weeks at sea, we were going to encounter probably four of these weather systems of storm or potentially hurricane force. So when I was briefing my crew, I had to strike a, re a balance between setting a realistic expectation of what was to come, but not scaring them unduly. But it got really uh, overwhelming for one of my crew members. She told me this story later. She told me about the night before we left Qingdao to embark on this leg. And she was in a hotel room. She wasn't the most courageous individual. This, doing this race was, was a big step out of her comfort zone. And she was pacing the floor all night, couldn't sleep a wink. And in her mind, she's playing through the mental film reel of what the next five weeks of her life are going to look like. And they're going to look like this. leaving Qingdao, this huge Chinese spectacular send-off as really only they can do. Thousands of people gathered around the marina basin as the boats sort of slip out one at a time with their big flags and battle songs playing. And the same crew member of mine, she's pacing again on the pontoon next to the boat in floods of tears, torn between her dream of sailing around the world and her fear of the leg to come. And it got to the point where we were the next boat to leave and we had a bag and passport there and said, you have to make a decision right now because you're coming with us or we're giving you this stuff back. And it still chokes me up thinking about it to see the tears running down her face and in that moment she found some courage inside of her and she held a hand up like that and someone grabbed it and, and pulled her on board and she came with us for that leg but we knew the fear factor was going to be huge for her. So we started uh, out of the marina, we were heading towards the start line of the race, and I was standing at the steering wheel of the boat, and she came and stood next to me and said quite quietly in my ear, promise me you'll keep me safe. It was a really heavy moment, and in that moment I did, I said, I promise, I promise I'll keep you safe. We'll get to the other side, you will have overcome some fears, but I promise I'll be there. So we started the race, we're heading down the Yellow Sea bound for the southern tip of Japan where we'll hang a left and head out into the Pacific Ocean. And I should say at this point a little bit about how we'd managed ourselves as a team and something that really made my team different. More than any of the other nine yachts in this race, my team were the most empowered. 
It was something we did right from the start, very deliberately, very strategically. We wanted to have a culture of ownership. I wanted the crew to take as much responsibility over everything that happened on board that boat. Um, obviously, safety is top priority. Um, you know, uh, and, and we were starting to see three huge benefits of that. The first was it was motivating. More than any of the other boats in this race, my team were the most motivated. Very well established in behavioral psychology that acting with control and volition and choice, having a say over what you do and how you do it to the greatest degree possible within the bounds of safety is a huge intrinsic motivator. And that's all I had. You know, I couldn't pay people money, give them a package, whatever. I had to fall back on those things inside of all of us that motivate us and having that control is really important. The second was it allowed me to really pull back and focus on the strategy. I moved from more of a supervisory role as the crew gained and uh, built their competence to the point where they needed me less and less. I was always obviously on hand if, if, if anything was going wrong or they, they could call on me. But day to day, I was removing myself, focusing more on the, the strategic planning, the weather routing, the navigation. That was where I could add the most value to the campaign. But most importantly, the reason for that autonomous approach was death because I had to be sure that at a minimum, at an absolute minimum, my crew could sail that boat to a safe port of call from anywhere in the world in the event that I was killed, incapacitated, or washed over the side. Now, that's a really scary thought, but it's one that every skipper and every captain of industry, I would argue, needs to take seriously. What happens if you're the single point of failure? You're suddenly removed. Can this team get itself at least in range of safety? And for me not to do that, for me to keep a tight hold on the control strings, you know, all decision-making gets routed through me as the authority figure, would actually be to selfishly rob them of the ability to get themselves to safety should the worst happen to me. And by my way of thinking, that would be an incredibly negligent thing to do. So those were the three benefits for the highly autonomous ownership culture that we had. We sped around the southern tip of Japan and out into the Pacific, and the first one of our North Pacific storms was upon us. To imagine what it's like in a North Pacific storm, imagine driving down the motorway in your car, 120, 130 kilometers an hour through a blizzard. Windscreen wipers are on their fastest setting, but still the visibility is poor. You can feel the car kind of getting buffered by the wind. Now imagine opening the sunroof, clipping yourself on to a strong fixture and then climbing out onto the roof of the car. That is the same feeling of climbing up the companionway ladder, opening the little plastic hatch and climbing out onto the deck of Spirit of Australia in a North Pacific storm. It is vile, cold, terrifying, and the wind just whips the sleet and snow at your face with stinging force. But despite all of that, we were still racing. We were, we, were, we were being as safe as we possibly could be within these conditions. We changed down from our big racing sails to our tiny little storm sails, these bulletproof pieces of canvas designed to withstand kind of anything you can throw at them. And we were just making headway into this storm. The problem was is that we were being very quickly overtaken by another boat in the fleet. In fact, it was our main rival, a boat called Hull and Humber. Every six hours, they were taking 15 nautical miles out of our lead, which in ocean yacht racing terms means they were absolutely creaming us. And in another six hours, they would be ahead of us, and they would now be in the lead of this round-the-world race. So I was torn. The competitive skipper in me said one thing, you know, we need to match these guys, we need to put some more canvas up, we're just throwing our lead away for nothing. The conservative skipper, safety-minded skipper in me said something else, you know, we're doing the right thing. You know, and I bounced this uh, idea off my crew member. In fact, he was my youngest crew member, 17, but a wise head on his shoulders. And I said, what do you think? And he said, Brendan, if Hull and Humber are pushing as hard as they are in these big conditions, they're going to break something. Just like we did, they'll break something. And I said, you're right, you're right, you're right. You've convinced me. And it didn't take long for his prediction to be vindicated. About an hour later, we received an unscheduled satellite phone call from the race director person in charge of the team ashore that looks after this race whilst it's at sea. And he tells me that they have had an accident on Hull and Humber. And it's not a piece of the boat that got broken, it was someone on board. But it wasn't just anybody, it was their skipper. Their skipper, a guy called Piers Duden, huge respect for him, fantastic sailor, was up on deck, taking charge. They were doing the maneuver that we'd done hours previously, changing to our storm sails when the boat was knocked down. So again, boat hit on its side, rolled over in the water. Looks like this.
So the helmsman thrown off their feet. Someone we call the dead man's helm just off camera grabs the wheel, keeps the boat under control. Chaos, carnage up front. Obviously, everyone's still attached with their safety tethers. Now the force of the water pushing past Piers pushed his leg up against a steel fitting and snapped his leg. Tib and Fibia pushed out through the skin. Really gruesome injury. He was taken below, dragging this trail of blood down the deck. His leg put in an air splint. He was sedated with morphine. But this boat, Holland Humber, it was now skipperless. It was now leaderless. And this had never happened in any of the previous editions of the race before. So this is what the race director is telling me. So our actions are to immediately suspend racing, turn the boat around and get back to Holland Humber because one of my crew on that leg just happened to be an A&E consultant, an, an emergency medical doctor. So she was going to be able to render assistance to them over the VHF radio. So I remember briefing my crew by the light of our head torches in the accommodation space and told them what, it, what I'd just been told and, and the fear factor went from a nine to a 10. But there was no question we wouldn't go when someone is in trouble at sea, you know, you, uh, the racing becomes irrelevant. So uh, we, we turned our yacht around and we started thumping our way back into the teeth of this storm to get back to Holland Humber. And by the time that we got there, a plan had come together. And the plan was that uh, the Japanese Coast Guard was sending out one of their fast patrol ships to evacuate Piers and get him back to Japan for medical treatment. And the plan was that one of the other skippers from one of the other nine boats in this fleet was going to transfer over from their own boat onto Holland Humber, make sure that the evacuation was done safely, and then they were going to skipper that boat plus their own boat the rest of the way across the North Pacific to San Francisco, still four weeks away. And the reason that the race director had ordered me to turn around, the reason he was checking in with me every hour, was because he wanted me to do that. That was his eventual ask. And the reason that he asked me, and I take no huge pride in it, was because he and all the stakeholders in this race, all the people they consult with, the international jury who govern the sport, they knew that from the outset, my team were the most empowered, had that ownership culture, were the most autonomous, and out of all the boats in this race, they were the ones best able to be able to take on this challenge without their nominated leader on board. But it was my rock and a hard place decision, as you can imagine, because no one can order a sea captain to do anything that's against their best judgment, whatever repercussions might happen ashore. So I had to agree to this willingly, and I did. I, I very reluctantly agreed. I put one of my crew in as acting skipper. He was my, uh, my elder gentleman, 63, with a hip replacement, but a fantastic communicator, natural leader. Um, and I, uh, I informed the crew that this is what I was going to be doing. We came across Holland Humber shortly after the storm had passed, and I was just about to transfer over from one boat to the other with, with safety lines rigged every which way. And I was saying goodbye to my crew. I was in a, dry, a diving dry suit. I was giving them all a hug, some words of encouragement. And just as I was about to step across, my scared crew member who I'd promised to keep safe, she came up and said, you're abandoning me. It's a really heavy moment. And I said, I said to her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know, I am, I'm sorry, I have to go. I have to go, I'm sorry. So I transferred over onto Holland Humber and I, I met this new crew who was sort of in tatters. I, I knew three people's names. I recognized a handful of faces. I went and saw Piers. He, he, was, he was bearing up well. The morphine was still working. The Japanese Coast Guard arrived shortly afterwards, evacuated him onto the ship, textbook maneuver. And then I was, uh, I was left. And, and what I really remember really vividly was, was looking back at my own boat from the outside. It seemed weird to be looking at it from, from outside. And, and the crew were all there and they're waving and they're having some dinner and they're giving the thumbs up and they didn't seem to miss me at all. Um, you know, which was great because it meant I'd got them, hopefully, to that place where they, they could sail the boat completely autonomously or I knew they could actually. But I knew also that this was the biggest challenge that any of us were ever gonna face. So whilst the rest of the fleet raced on ahead of us, we turned our bows eastward and started sailing towards San Fran with a new mission. And our, our, our mission was now to get Spirit of Australia and Holland Humber to San Francisco with no injuries, with no more damage, and with confidence high, which we thought was a pretty good summation of what we had to do. And it was all going well until the day we crossed the international dateline, smack bang in the middle of the North Pacific. And I've been watching this weather system creep up from behind us. The first day I saw it on the, the little black and white synoptic chart that we were emailed, it was a little punchy, little low pressure system coming towards us. Could go north or could go south and it was rated as a gale. The next day I saw it, it was a bit deep, a bit more intense, looking pretty scary now and, and heading straight for us and it had been upgraded to a storm. And then this day I'll never forget, just double clicking, looking at this innocuous black and white picture on the screen and this thing has become a behemoth. 
the deepest, most intense low pressure system I've ever seen. And the abbreviations next to the center of it read HRCN for hurricane. I still get tingles now just thinking about how that made me feel at the time. Hurricane force winds in the middle of the North Pacific, with about as far from land as you can get in any direction, with two crews, nominally under my command, how I was going to keep them safe. I mean, to say I was worried would be the most epic understatement. We got as ready as we possibly could be. We went through all our disaster planning scenarios. We opened the training manuals. We, we, we just refreshed our minds on all of these disaster s uh, scenarios that could befall us. Man overboards, dismastings, abandoned ship. We got all the equipment that we would need ready. We assigned roles. We, we, we did absolutely everything we could and then waited. And then darkness descended on the seascape and the waves. I'll never forget the waves. As this hurricane began to bear its teeth at us, they would just get bigger and steeper. The whole boat tilting forward and forward and forward as the wave picked us up from behind. And then with a shunt, it would begin surfing. 32 tons pitching forward into darkness with no idea what's going to happen at the bottom. And the danger is the boat surfs down the wave. It, it loses control. It turns side on. And then the wave you've just surfed down rolls the boat right over in the water, completely inverts it, possibly drowning the crew up on deck. It was the job of the two people on deck, the helm and the dead man's helm, to just keep the long axis of the boat pointing down the wave. That was all they had to do. Everyone else was inside the boat, lashed into their bunks. It was terrifying, and then we started getting knocked down at the crescendo of this hurricane, probably once every 25 minutes, just like you saw in the video there. And it was after the first of our big knockdowns that I went to the heads, and I felt this strong psychosomatic reaction I've never had before. And I was violently sick, just vomiting out of sheer worry, convinced that one of my crew was going to die tonight. The boat struggles back upright. I come out of the heads. I run up to the companionway ladder, look out. The two crew are still attached to the boat. They kind of give me the thumbs up. And the radio rings. And it's my own boat, Spirit of Australia, someone asking me, are we going to get through this? Are we going to survive this? And I tell them, yes. We are going to get through this. Just drive the boat straight, drive the boat straight. And what I didn't have to say was, and, and hope for the best. And maybe, yes, maybe it's fatalistic. But if there was one of those waves out there with our name on us, with our, with our name on it, it was going to get us and roll us over. We couldn't see it. We couldn't avoid it. We were there. All we could do was react. And then the satellite phone rings again. And it's the race director who tells us that one of the yachts ahead of us who's starting to experience the worst of this hurricane has set off its EPIRB, its emergency beacon. Now, these beacons are only ever set off in the, the, the most dire emergencies. The boat's broken its back and starting to sink. It's caught fire. Someone's dead or dying with some grievous injuries. As, as anyone in the, the offshore industry knows, the EPIRB doesn't say what the problem is. It just says, this is where we are. Everyone come and help us. So the race director tells me this and tells me to uh, divert our course and head towards the location of this beacon because we are, we are upwind and we can still get them. The other boats would have to turn around to get there. A search and rescue plane is flying south from Alaska, the US Air Force, to, to investigate. And several container ships in the area have been diverted to also go to the location of this beacon. And by the time that we get there, this is what we found. One of our competing yachts, a yacht called California, has happened exactly as I described it. Surfed down a wave, rolled over, completely inverted. The crew held under water for about 40 seconds before the boat rights itself. The mast, which is never designed to withstand that kind of force, just buckled, snapped, sank to the bottom of the Pacific. The, the crew had to, to leap into action, cut it all free. Now, California were in a bad way because they had no rig, they had no sails, no way of propelling themselves other than with the engine inside the boat. But of course, they didn't have enough diesel on board to get to the other side of the Pacific. So the plan was is that they would join my convoy, and we worked out that between us, if we were really conservative without diesel, we gave every last bit to them that we didn't need. We had just enough between us to get them the rest of the way there. So they fell into formation, and now I had three boats, which added another kind of burden I didn't really need or want. But it had a nice little side perk for me in that people started calling me Admiral because I, 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 I had a flotilla. I was collecting them as I went, it would seem. And that's what we spent the next 10 days doing. That is a 27 vertical meter wave, by the way. That's a 20 meter yacht. Biggest waves I've ever seen, and that was when it was on the way down. The next 10 days we spent transferring diesel to uh, California in these eight plastic uh, fuel containers, three and a half tons we did in the end. 
until through a gathering dusk we came to the entrance of San Francisco Bay, towering red Golden Gate Bridge. Now California had generated a huge amount of media interest. This was their home port and they'd been through this big ordeal and this sort of flotilla of yachts and ribs came and escorted them the last mile under the bridge. And as I sailed under there on, on Hull and Humber, I just relaxed and know that my step crew was safe or my two crews were safe. And I was just so proud of my team on Holland Humber, my step crew, I called them. How they'd bounced back from adversity, losing their skipper. They were ready to take on their new skipper who had taken the rest of the way around the world. I'd like to think I built their confidence back up to the point where they could carry on like that. But my proudest moment came a few minutes later when through the night I saw the green nav light of my own boat sail under that same span. My team, my guys and gals, just ordinary people from ordinary walks of life, and what they've achieved was absolutely extraordinary. This had never been done before in any of the previous editions of the race. A crew had never had to be asked to sail across an ocean without their skipper on board. And these guys had done it. And they'd done it on the coldest, meanest, hardest leg of this race. And I think it's written on our faces as that when we were reunited shortly afterwards in the dockside. One of my happiest and most cherished memories and that, uh, that roughy, tufty ocean racing skipper persona that I'm sure you've all noticed, crumbled in that moment. Very, very emotional being reunited with those guys on the dockside. So for me, that horrendous experience in the North Pacific just cemented in my mind the need of a leader in an organization or a sub-team leader working on the tools, someone who's in charge and has the responsibility for the safety of others, to loosen those control strings, to take some backward steps, to allow their team to stand to their full height, to try as much as they can to create that culture of ownership. And I think it's perfectly summarized by this quote here. Whether you agree with his politics and the places he's been and the things he's done, I think this is a great quote by a US Army general. And he says, the role of a leader is not that of controlling puppet master, but as a crafter of culture to truly allow others to step up. And I really believe that. And for me, what the, the offshore safety uh, 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 award that was handed out, Gert, congratulations, by the way, very well deserved, celebrates this same thing. Someone who took that empowerment that was given to them, had that feeling of psychological ownership and created an innovative solution to keep the people around them safe. It's also something that was reflected well in Michael's statements about Total having their cards where anyone can stop a job. Regardless of, of rank or where they sit in the hierarchy, everyone has the ownership of, of being able to say this is unsafe and, and we need to stop it right now. Very, very powerful stuff. So where did this leave us? I uh, reintegrated myself into the team. We had one of our big meetings. We talked about all the lessons we'd learned on that race. Um, I, I reintegrated into the crew. We uh, um, took all the lessons we'd learned and we fed them back into our campaign. I became even more of a consultant to the crew. Less of a directing force, more of a supporting presence. And over the course of the rest of that race, we put in some of our best and most consistent performances, as well as, as having a, a, a very high safety track record, no serious injuries and, and certainly no fatalities. And here we are crossing the final finish line of the race in the, the beautiful but chocolatey waters of the River Humber. Thousands of people gathered along the, the riverside to watch the boats cross the final finish line of this race. And as we do, my team and I on Spirit of Australia, we celebrate joyously because we'd won the race. And we hadn't just won it, we'd won it by the largest margin this race had ever been won by. But more than that, we brought everyone home safe. The mothers, fathers, sons and daughters home safe to their families. So the Clipper race was a race of 10 teams, not a race of 10 yachts. And I would contend that the same lessons that I've talked to you about today hold true in your industry. And it's the organizations and the teams that are going to best weather the economic storms, the political storms, the environmental storms that are on our horizon. The voices we heard outside of this building today are only going to get louder and more incessant. The teams that are going to be able to function and keep their fellows safe and perform in that kind of environment are the teams I would contend to you that can do these two things amongst many others. They have that culture. 
where they learn those lessons and those lessons only get learned once. And they're filled with autonomous people who feel that sense of psychological ownership for the safety of everything that goes on around them. My crew member who was on the race looking for a husband, she didn't find what she was after. But she's found love subsequently, so her story has a happy end. My uh, ultra-competitive crew member, Mr. Win at all costs, he was absolutely made up. He got what he wanted. But you know what? The race had really softened him. Between all this heavy weather, hard call stuff, there's loads of time to just reflect and look back on your life, away from the, the trappings and the people you know. And he was someone who was very driven by status, by achievement, and he said he asked himself one day, sat there by himself, who am I without my achievements? And he said he didn't have a very good answer. And he needed to readdress that in the relationships that he had when, when he got back to shore. So I think the race, he got what he wanted, but it also gave him what he needed. My scared crew member, she wouldn't talk to me when we arrived in San Francisco. That feeling of abandonment was just too, too raw for her, but uh, I couldn't have someone on the boat who just wouldn't talk to the skipper. So I, I had to reach out and rebuild that relationship with her. And, and as I did, I came to realize that that theme of abandonment was one that had played out a number of times in her life, and this was just the latest iteration of someone who had made a promise to her and then had left her. But of all my crew, hers has the biggest turnaround, her life. She still goes back, sells insurance as a day job, but she also goes and talks to school children, young adolescents, and talks to them about goal setting, following their ambitions, not letting fear stop them. You know, those lessons we all want our young people to understand. For me, the biggest takeaway I had from the race was about creating that space where people can talk honestly and openly. The sound of success is honest conversation and learning those lessons and making sure they don't happen again. And the biggest challenge as a leader I faced wasn't out there, it was in here and in here. So my question to you, my final question is, will the Danish oil and gas sector still be thriving in the way it is today in 10 years time with all the storms that are on our horizon? It's entirely down to you guys, entirely down to you guys in this room. But based on everything I've heard, based on the panel discussions, based on the vibrant discussions and the presentations we've heard today, I think it will be. And as someone who recognizes that the comfortable lifestyle that I enjoy in a modern Western democracy depends heavily on the products that your industry outputs, I hope you will be. Thank you so much for giving me some time this afternoon to share my story with you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.